means brand new. It means like something that has not been previously known, unheard of, uh, brand new. Not like iPhone 6. What iPhone are we on now? 6, 7, blech. 8, iPhone 8. So we're like, whatever, iPhone 7. Like, I'm not talking about like new versions of phones. I'm talking about like, a, like when the first phone ever came out. Like, what are we talking on a can for? Like, something brand new. Like, how can I hear your voice and I'm not looking at you? That's, that's the kind of new that he's talking about. Not something that's just a new version, something brand new. And here's what he's saying to you. I want you to listen to this. There is a new family that you and I crave more than we can really put into words. That, that God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, before time began desires us to be in this great family. It's the family that you long for. It's a new community, and that's what Jesus is doing. He's drawing people in to a new community. And so there's new, these new relationships in the church. The church is to be modeling these new relationships that are marked by the kingdom. And so we're going to look at two, two new relationships, uh, and then a so what. The first one is, this church thing is about a new relationship with God a new way of thinking about a relationship with God that's totally different than any man-made religion. Brand new. And to try to put that, that, that religion, Jesus and Christianity, into the old box, it'll blow it up. You can't do it. Jesus says, you cannot make, turn me into a religion. And they'll say, well, we'll kill you. Okay, you kill me, I'll come back to life. He said that. You kill me, I'll come back to life. And they did kill him. So the first one's a new relationship with God. The second is a new relationship with other people. And then so what? Let's look at a new relationship with God. A radically, Christianity is, a, is about a radically new relationship with God. And the message of the church, the message of the cross, is about this radically new relationship with God, different from any other religion that has ever existed. And it's one that's not performance-based. How do I know that? He called a man named Levi to be one of his disciples. Of all, of all the people in the first century he could have called, he called a tax collector. Now, if you've been around Sunday school, you may know a little bit of tax collectors. Let me just, tax collectors were terrible people. They were Jews in occupied territory. They were, they were occupied and under the oppression of the Romans. So it was almost like, if we were taken over by another country, Russia, China, whatever, and then an American went to go work for the Russians to collect taxes from the Americans, and he would collect more taxes than he needed to to pad his own pockets. I mean, total jerks. They were so despised. And one of the reasons, as Jewish people, they couldn't be involved in any of the, the culture of the Jews, the ceremonies of the Jews, the religion of the Jews, because they always come in contact with the Gentiles and their filthy money. They were just total scoundrels. Now, I want to compare the, the tax collectors, Levi. That's who Levi is. And he is like, it's his, this is his booth. Like, he's a head tax collector. Like, so he's like the head of the losers, right? That's what he is. And then compare... Levi with this other group called the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the, they were good, they were the good guys in the eyes of the people. Very respected. Very well trained. Had the Old Testament memorized. Very devout. If you were like a Jew in that day, you would want to drop the name of like a Pharisee that you knew. Like, hey, I was hanging out Gamaliel's the other night. Anyway, yeah, I'm friends with Gamaliel. It's pretty cool. Like, they were people with crazy power. So powerful they could have someone like Jesus killed. They were so powerful and respected. And so who does Jesus go to? And this is why the Pharisees hated Jesus so much. He goes straight to Levi and says, follow me, be one of my followers. Head of the losers, be one of my followers. And Levi does. He does. He just starts following him. Okay. He leaves everything behind and he follows Jesus. It's a beautiful picture of calling, of election, of God just choosing someone. The absolute, he doesn't clean himself up. He doesn't get himself ready. He doesn't like, show, he just is like sitting there counting his money. Jesus walks up and says, follow me. He's like, great, let's do this. And so what does Levi do? It's like the first church plant meeting. It's the first gathering. It's a mixer. He 
invites who? All his loser, crazy, scoundrel, dirty, filthy, awful friends. And Jesus is right in the middle of them, eating supper with them. And in the first century, when you had, when you were at table, that's actually a thing. When you were at table, you're basically saying, hey, we are in community. I want to know you. And the Pharisees are walking by because at eating at table, Levi would have had tons of money, would have been an open air sort of account, would be a, a, an event where they could have walked by and listened to what they were talking about. And the Pharisees, what is he doing? Here's what Jesus is saying. I'm doing something that no human being ever is expected. I'm telling you that a relationship with God has nothing to do with how good you are. I'm saying it's about grace. Guys, when you tell, someone tells you they get grace, they don't. No one, none of us get grace. Grace happens to you. Like when you see a baby, have you ever seen a baby baptized? They're just sitting there and they're beautiful and, and they're wearing these little, even the boys are in Memphis, their boys would wear dresses and, and they would bring them up and you would, you, they would look so pretty and then you would hit them with water and they'd just go like, what are you doing? Why is there water all over me? And so that's what grace is like. Grace is just like, hey, you look great. Boom, it's going to happen to you. Here's what it's about. God loves you. It's because he does. But, 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 just because he does. Because he does. Grace means he knows the worst thing about you. He knows the things about you that you can't change and you would do anything to change and you wish, this, wish that you could bleach them out of your soul. He knows more about you than you know about yourself. And here's what he says. I've already decided to love you. Get over it. Follow me. Let's have supper. That'll get you killed. That's not religion. Religion is this. You do enough. You clean yourself up enough. You try hard enough, you want it enough, you look good enough, God will accept you. Christianity is this. God shows up and says, I accept you. Let's go. That is brand new. And if that's not the Christianity that you've heard, if that's not the Christianity that, that you walked into this place, God is telling you like, that's what it means to follow Jesus. That is the basis of the church. Jesus died while you were still sinners. While you couldn't clean yourself up. It's a relationship with God where you don't have to be cool. Y'all listen to me. This is like so good for high school. I like wish I could like get in a DeLorean. That's an that's a 80s reference. I wish I could get a time machine and go back and look at 15-year-old Richie and go like, you don't have to be cool for God to love you. You could stop trying to be wonderful and good looking and strong and all these things in your appearance to be all together. You could just be Richie. You're just a rinky dink redneck from Arkansas. I just love, it's as simple as this. All you have is need. I love you. I love you. I'm crazy about you. It's a brand new relationship with God. And it's not just this new relationship with God that he's showing us by this relationship with Levi and then all of Levi's friends. Do you see Levi see something different about Jesus? He invites all his friends. He invites all his friends. Like, you have to meet this guy. You have to meet this guy. Why do we have to meet him? Because he, because he asked me to be one of his followers. What? You'd be one of his followers? Yes, I'm coming. Who is this gracious? Who is this rabbi? Here's what... You know what? They throw a party. Jesus tells a story about a bridegroom. Weddings to this day in Jerusalem, because I've seen one. I was in Jerusalem. I saw our weddings. Our throwdowns. <laughs> I was in a hotel, and they, had a, they, were, they were carrying the groom on one end. They were carrying him in a chair. And they were carrying the, the, the bride in another chair. And they were playing like horns and drums and they were doing like dances all the way into this this is not even the this is not even the reception they didn't even said i do yet 
And they're coming together, and it's this glorious event. It was so loud. I, could, I was talking to my dad. We were in Jerusalem. I was talking to my dad. We couldn't even hear each other. It was like, it was like, a, it, was like it was like before a football game. Here's what he's saying. You now have an access to God that is marked by joy. Religion is marked by bitterness. Religion is marked by heaviness. Religion is marked by fear that you're always going to get kicked out. And this new, this new wineskin, this new life, this new cloth, you cannot tie it to religion. You cannot make it what you want. You can't control it. All you can do is enjoy it. Wedding receptions are the only times I see Presbyterians dance or really even have fun. <laughs> like, I was, a, I was a pastor of a church in Memphis, like a big brick church, like deep south, like very... When they had wedding receptions... I saw elders doing like, she's a brick, bum, bum, no house, bum, bum, no. and I was like, this is outrageous. <laughs> like, a wedding reception's fun. Jesus is, here's the point. Jesus is describing his relationship as a feast, as a festival, as a party, as being with the bridegroom. Let me ask you this. Do you dare laugh in the presence of Jesus? Smile in the presence of Jesus. That you get to come as a, to the Heavenly Father because your brother Jesus has invited you and by his own blood, his own blood, his own body is the centerpiece of this wedding. He invites you into this relationship that you may tango through the sacrifice as one writer said. The reason I know Jesus is like this, I'm not, I'm not an expert about very many things. Honestly, like about almost any, nothing, but I am an expert on Jesus. And I've read the gospel so many times I'm picking apart. This is, you don't even know what Jesus is like. Here's one story. One day Jesus was on his way through a town and this really powerful man asked him to come and heal his daughter. His name was Jairus and he was the head of a synagogue and it would have been a really big deal for Jesus to go and, and heal this man's daughter immediately. He's on his way through this town and he's walking through and he feels someone grab like the hem of his garment, like the outside of his robe. And it's a woman who's been bleeding for 12 years and she spent all her money for doctor after doctor made her worse and worse and worse. She was filthy. She couldn't have any relationship with anyone because of her uncleanness. And so in a last ditch effort, she simply holds on to Jesus and passes through. Well, there are all these people walking around Jesus and Jesus stops on his way to heal a very important person's daughter. And he said, who touched me? And the disciples are always confused by Jesus. Like, what are you talking? Who touched you? Like, we're all touching you. <laughs> we're all touching you. Like, what do you mean who touched you? Like, no, someone touched me. I felt power go out from me. And they're like, oh, here's something weird's about to happen. <laughs> this is going to be weird. And so he's going through the town. He said, someone touched me. Who touched me? Because this woman had scurried off. She had come to him, she had come to Jesus on her knees and she had grabbed the hem of his garment and it imme immediately healed him, her. Twelve years. And so she scurries off and she doesn't come out. What, who touched my, who touched me? And then finally she comes up and she's groveling. She throws herself before Jesus and she confesses everything that she did. And do you know what he says? It's the only time. This, y'all want to know what Jesus is like? You know what Christianity is like? Do you know what the church is supposed to be about? Jesus says something he only said once in all the Gospels. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Jesus Christ went out of his way, stopped what he was doing so he could find this throwaway person who was totally unclean, who was a complete nobody, hovering over in the corners so he could give her a name, daughter. You know what a daughter's like? This is the new relationship with God. Like my daughter, my little nine-year-old, I'm glad she's not in here so I don't embarrass her. I was in Texas for a weekend. I come back in town. There's this poster on the door with like a picture of me with my guitar, like 
little marker thing. And she was like, daddy's awesome. Welcome home, daddy. Glad you're home. Zit, zit, zit. All this stuff like that. It was like, this is, oh my gosh, I, I'm, I love this. I love being alive right this moment. I'll, I'll, I'll open the door. She jumps into my arms, legs this way, jumps into my arms, kisses me, kisses me, kisses me, kisses me, kisses me. I was like, this is the best welcome ever. ever. You know what? That's what a daughter does to a father. And so when Jesus says, daughter, you don't grovel on your feet to me anymore. That's religion. You don't run away from me, me anymore. You come straight to God. I'm doing something brand new. Y'all, if, if your view of church is this old, moldy, dusty, dead experience, it is not the experience that Jesus wants. Jesus wants to be a community of daughters and sons. New relationship with God. Second point, new relationship with others. So a new relationship has to flow. So we have this new relationship with God that's based on rejoicing and freedom and hope and, and not heaviness and laughter. Even in the midst of our sorrow and encouragement and warmth. Now we have this new relationship with other people. It has to flow out of this. And so the Pharisees asked Jesus, why do you eat with tax collectors and sinners? And so here's what they're saying. God is interested in good people. God helps, helps those who help themselves. That's not in the Bible. Y'all know that's not in the Bible, don't you? God helps those who help themselves. That's, that's not in the Bible. That's like in Ben Franklin. I think Ben Franklin said that. Jesus is really upsetting the serious people who befriend when he befriends and eats and drinks with nobodies. They're not the good people. And so here's what it means that Jesus is he's establishing these new relationships. Jesus destroys the us and them. You know the us and them. Those people out there. So the church is not to be the good people and all those people out there. The, the good people are, are, are in here and have their lives together. And the bad people, the, the other, Jesus totally blows that up. One writer put it this way. It was the Pharisees who developed the doctrine of salvation by separation. They were practicing segregationists, believing holiness was achieved by avoiding contact with unclean sinners. No wonder why they were scandalized by the behavior of Jesus who dealt with Samaritans, ate dinner with tax collectors, placed his hand upon lepers, ministered to harlots. Our Lord was accused of being a drunkard and a glutton because he spent his time and frequented those places where needy people were. And so he's building this new kingdom that shows that you don't have to be anybody. Just come and be loved. Come and be forgiven. That this new community is not about us and them. And so this is what he does when he forms his 12 disciples. I'll just give you two names. Levi, the tax collector, who later becomes Matthew and writes the gospel of Matthew, the man we're talking about now. That's Levi. And then a man named Simon the Zealot. Probably don't know, we don't know very much about Simon the Zealot other than he hated the Romans. The Zealots were like first century terrorists trying to overthrow the Romans. And so here's what Jesus does. You talk about having a sense of humor. And his disciples, he calls a tax collector who works for the Romans and then someone who is ready to like blow up the Romans. And that's the church. You think, like, here's the point. Jesus is saying, this is what I want my community to be about. Grace. I'm going to find Republicans and Democrats and black and white and male and female and weirdos and jocks and nerds and wannabe nerds and hipsters and, and, and every type of person to come here and experience the banquet of my grace so that they can all be brought in. I'm going to do it right here. That's what it's about. There's no us in them. There's Jesus and everybody else. There's Jesus and everyone else. That's all there is. It's like Jesus is inviting humanity into the very throne room, into the very living room, into the living room. And when you mess with people's living room, you get killed. He was messing with the living room of the Pharisees. He was telling that 
these losers and these outcasts, that they were children of Abraham, that they were the chosen one. They were people of the kingdom. And so he blows up the us and them. So here's my question for you. Who are those people in your world? The, those. They may be in your youth group. Youth group. And here's, the, do you know that we can be a snob about anything? Anything. After 41 years on this planet, we can turn anything into a snobby thing. Like there was a cool running store in Memphis and a good friend of mine ran it. And it's like the coolest running store. And like people can be total snobs about running shoes. Snobs about sunglasses. Snobs about clothes. Snobs about phones. Snobs about, oh, Nashville. Snobs about food. Oh my goodness. Farm to table hipster coolness. Snobs about coffee. Snobs about other beverages that you can't drink yet. Snobs about, (laughs) snobs about, denominations, snobs about books, snobs about, oh, snobs about music. Who are the people that, honestly, here are the people, who are the people that you're snobby towards? And Jesus is saying, like, I want to free you from having to hate people. I can free you from having to hate people. Why? Because you're one of the people that you should hate. See, what the church is about, because there is this banquet, because there is this love, because there is this grace, there is this hospitality in the church that we are to be hospitable people brought into this community. Now, I know that most of our churches don't look that way. But what would it look like for you to begin to pray that you, not that your church would change, that your pastor would change, or they think, but that you would become a hospitable person. Because remember what Jesus did to the woman? That you would become someone that would love to bring people in rather than shut them out. Folks, that was, that's what the church is. Not a club. And so what? I'll close with this. Nash, Nashville and Vanderbilt, where I am, I think are the capitals of FOMO. Do y'all know what FOMO is? FOMO, of course you do. You're so hip. I heard the word dank. I'm hearing all kind of good terminology this week. Fear, the fear of missing out. Vanderbilt runs on the fear of missing out. I think the acceptance rate is like 8% to get into Vanderbilt. I'm not getting into Vanderbilt. They're the best of the best of the best of the smartest of the prettiest of the coolest of the strongest people. And here's what I guess what? Guess they're all totally insecure. Let me, let me, let me, let me let you know a little secret. They're, they live in constant fear of missing out on the next thing. So guess what they do? They all Instagram the lives that are crushing it. That's what they do. So when they're doing something, they have to constantly Instagram like, here's what I'm doing at Chili's eating this brownie dessert. What are you doing? Here I am in, uh, in England. Here I am in France. Here I am in Australia. Here I'm in New Zealand. Like New Zealand? Here I am with these important people. What are you doing? Here's a, the church is to be a place where FOMO dies. It could be the one place, the church community living like the kingdom, be the one place where the fear of missing out dies. How can that be true? Because what do we say last night? You don't have to fear of missing out on the most important thing in the history of the cosmos. You have been brought in to the heavenly realm, into the family of God, because God wants you there. You're not missing out on that. The last thing I'll close is with this. You know what we really want? Every human being that's ever been born. You know what every human being, that's, what every human being is born wanting is just to matter and belong. You just show up on the planet and you're saying this, someone tell me that I matter and that I belong. Every single human. Tell me that I matter and that I belong and that I can do it without performing. That I just showed up. Like, here's it. Being human is enough. Just breathing is enough. I tell that to Vanderbilt students. They feel naughty when I tell that to them. <laughs> what, if I, I said, what if I told you that you, just like you, Skin and bones, hair, green eyes, just sitting there, you, totally enough. They were like, it feels really good and I feel really guilty about that. I was like, well, you're going to have a hard life. Because here's what you're going to try to matter and belong by all the crap that you do and it's never going to work. And this is the beginning, the church is the beginning of a community where you can just be enough because you're alive. 
where you can just be enough, not because you're pretty enough, not because you're smart enough, not because you're strong enough, not because you're cool enough, just because you are drawing air and oxygen into your lungs on this planet made in the image of God and God adores you. You're just enough. That is scandalous, but that's what it's about. I'll close with this illustration of my nephew, Sully. You know, you have different nephews and Sully's dear to my heart. He's a middle child like me. He's a weird little middle child like me. <laughs> Sully, um, he wore his, uh, his pull-up into his latter years. You know what a pull-up is. It's a pull-up diaper that you sleep in. He wore it like they probably had to go get him special ordered for Sully. Uh, he just didn't want to not wear it. He just liked it. It's his thing and has zero, zero shame about it, right? So my brother, my little brother says, they're, they, they were going to have uh, uh, babysitters, cool babysitters from high school. And Spitzer, my, my brother said, hey, Sully, you know, maybe tonight uh, you can wear like your big boy underwear and not wear your pull-up. And Sully was like, no, nah, i just wear my pull-up. <laughs> and he was like, I just thought maybe you'd be. And Spitzer realized like, oh, now I'm shaming him. I thought maybe you want to be a big boy and wear things. No, I'm just going to wear my pull-up. I'm good. And so like he walks out, the girls come in. He walks out, all he's wearing is pull-up. He's like, he's built like a little like tank. He talks like this. <laughs> Big gap in his teeth. He's just, he's, here's the thing. He's just alive on this planet and he just shows up and he sees these girls and he's like, hey, my name is Sully. Let's go back to my room. And he's like, <laughs> pull up, rocking his pull up. Hair sticking up. <laughs> when Jesus Christ said, listen to me. When Jesus Christ said to me, Unless you become like a child, you will never enter my kingdom. With your pull up. With you. The bride of Christ is to be a community where being you is enough. Where you can stop hating and stop judging and st stop comparing yourself for just a little moment to tell the world there's a place where you can just be sully. That's what this world needs. That is what the great evangelistic picture is that we're the people that can stop FOMO just for a minute and be human. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this story. Thank you, Jesus. I pray that this would be real um, to us, that you would give us faith to see it. It is so new to us, even though we've heard it, some of us, many times. And so bless us now as we consider it tonight. Amen.